Ken Landa, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Nucala or Mepolizumab. This is a drug granted marketing approval by the Food and Drug Administration in 2015 as a monthly subcutaneous injection for people who have severe asthma, severe asthma of the eosinophilic subtype. That means that there are a lot of eosinophils floating around in the bloodstream. That's just a common kind of white blood cell that tends to indicate some sort of allergic reaction. Well, in individuals who have this type of asthma, they can additionally add on therapy with Nucala. Nucala is not a substitute for the other medicines, and the other medicines must not be discontinued. And Nucala is not a treatment for acute asthma. It was also given approval, by the way, in 2017 for an unusual inflammatory disease of the blood vessels. And the company is looking forward to perhaps getting FDA approval for marketing the drug for chronic obstructive lung disease, COPD, with eosinophils. Well, if we look at asthma, there are probably about 30 million people in the United States suffering from this condition. And there are about 14 million office visits that occur because of asthma every year. There are somewhere around 2 million visits to emergency rooms and 400,000 to 500,000 hospitalizations every year because of asthma. And the cost of treating asthma is in excess of $50 billion. How do we define severe asthma? Well, the definition varies depending on the organization and the criteria vary. But the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society, they say that severe asthma is uncontrollable asthma in spite of the fact that a person's taking high doses of inhaled corticosteroids, maybe additionally the long-acting beta agonists, maybe some leukotriene modifiers or theophylline-like drugs, and even oral steroids for at least half of the previous year. It seems that eosinophils are a major precipitant of asthma, and Nucala fights the chemical that the eosinophils need to survive and to allow them to break down inside the lungs. So if we don't have any of this IL-5, then we don't have growth and differentiation of the eosinophils. We don't have recruitment of the eosinophils into the lungs. We don't have activation of the eosinophils. And the eosinophils can't live very long. Well, the drug itself is actually a type of gamma globulin. And remember, it's not for acute asthma attacks, not for acute bronchospasm. It's preventive. The treatment is 100 milligrams delivered once every four weeks. The drug comes as a freeze-dry powder. needs to be reconstituted with some sterile water for injection swirled in the bottle for about five minutes until it dissolves, can be kept for about up to eight hours after it's mixed, should be injected by a healthcare practitioner, injected in the office, and then you should wait around for a while. The injection is into the upper thigh or maybe the abdomen, the upper arm. The reason you stay in the doctor's office for a while is because there's the potential for hypersensitivity reactions. Usually they come within hours, but sometimes they could be delayed for several days. Hypersensitivity reactions, in other words, anaphylaxis, anaphylactic shock. Some people get swelling of the tongue, difficulty breathing, bronchospasm, the blood pressure falls down, they can get hives and a rash and flushing, muscle pain. But the usual side effects are nothing more than headache and back pain and fatigue. And sometimes at the injection site, there's a little bit of redness and swelling and itchiness, maybe some burning. Unfortunately for the drug company, a patient or so on therapy developed shingles. Now, most likely the shingles has absolutely nothing to do with this particular drug. But because of the timing, company had to say, well, we recommend that you get a shingles or at least consider a shingles vaccine before you get the treatment. And since those eosinophils are important 
and fighting certain kind of helminth infections, helminth, roundworms, tapeworms, flatworms, flukes. Well, if you live in that part of the country or the world where those things are common, go get them treated first. As far as treatment in pregnancy is concerned, there's no significant information. We know that the medicine's going to cross the placenta, and we know that people who have asthma who are pregnant are going to have significant problems. They're going to have a higher incidence of, of preeclampsia and premature delivery and deliver babies that are small for their gestational age, low birth weight. But the drug can't be recommended at the present time for pregnant women. Certainly not recommended for lactating women either. Probably crosses into the breast milk, but we don't think that's going to be a significant problem. It's not recommended for children under age 12. And when we look overall at the trials of the medicine, it appears the trials show the drug's OK. So the average age of people involved in the trials was about 50. Overwhelmingly, these were Caucasians. The people had asthma history for about 20 years. They were mostly non-smokers. They had at least two exacerbations in the previous year, even though they were being treated with high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and additional controller medicines, including oral corticosteroids at times. Their eosinophil count was elevated to at least Three, uh, at least 150, and oftentimes in excess of 300. And the sputum often had those eosinophils in excess of 3%. And sometimes these people on exhalation had measurement of nitric oxide in excess of 50 parts per billion. Well, the trials, when they were done, supported either a dose of 75 milligrams given intravenously once a month or a dose of 100 milligrams given subcutaneously once a month. So right away you can tell that the company was going to go for the subcutaneous, much easier treatment. Well, the studies looked at how much air a person could blow out. Normally a person, a woman, could blow out about three and a half quarts of air in one second, a man four and a half quarts. But people with asthma that were in the trials could blow out only less than two quarts of air in the first second. So they were blowing out only about 60% of what was predicted. Well, the trials showed that if the eosinophil count was less than 150 inside the bloodstream, that the drug probably wasn't really substantially beneficial. There were two studies, and both studies show that there was about a 50% reduction compared to placebo in how the patients did. So they had 50% reduction in the frequency of exacerbations of the asthma. And not only that, they were able to reduce the dose of steroids. So the ability to reduce the dose of steroids by more than 50% happened in half of the people receiving the Nucala, but only about a third of the people receiving the placebo. And if we look at overall, the ability to almost completely eliminate the steroids, well, one in nine among the placebo group, but one in four in the Nucala group. So that's pretty good. But unfortunately, there was no change in the steroid dose in about a third of the people who got the Nucala and about half of the people who received the placebo. Well, was there significant benefit if we look at the change in the FEV1, the ability to blow out the air in the first second? Eh, a little bit, but not really super impressive. And if we look at the asthma control questionnaire, on how the patients rated themselves, it was not statistically significant versus placebo. And as a matter of fact, there's a drug that's used to treat childhood eczema. Now it progressed to adulthood. And it's known as Dupixin. And it's been on the market for some time. And it's currently at the FDA for consideration of treatment for asthma. It seems to do even better than this Nucala.
If we look at the number of nighttime awakenings, not significantly improved. If we look at the ability or the need to use rescue medications, again, not significantly different. Interestingly, if we look at the number of days from school that were missed, fewer days in people receiving the placebo than the Nukawa. Now, granted, that's a small study. How does Nukawa work? Well, it binds to that IL-5. The IL-5 then can't reach the receptor on the eosinophil, and then, unfortunately for the eosinophil, it can't survive. That's simply the way the medicine works. And if the eosinophil can't survive, then we have a reduction in airway inflammation, airway hyperresponsiveness, we have a reduction in the bronchial constriction, in the airway obstruction, in the airway remodeling. So all that is good. And it seems that the Nucala can keep the eosinophil count in the bloodstream quite low. And as a matter of fact, even by day three, there's significant benefit. And if we look out after therapy stops, we still have a 70 to 90 percent reduction over the month or so after treatment. So that's sort of impressive. On the other hand, asthma is not eliminated by Nucala. There are a lot of other cells that are in the lung aside from the eosinophil that participate in asthma. So we have the mast cells, the neutrophils, the macrophages, the lymphocytes, and the innate lymphoid cells. All of those cells are in the lung. And we have a lot more chemicals other than IL-5. In fact, that dupixin that I mentioned a moment ago works on a different chemical known as IL-4, interleukin-4. So asthma is a complicated disease. Well, if we look at Nucala, after the injection, the half-life of the medicine in the body is about three weeks. Medicines metabolize the way gamma globulins normally metabolize, so it doesn't need good liver function, doesn't need good kidney function, and doesn't seem to interact with other kind of medicines. But recently we've become aware that the eosinophil might have some kind of a role in cancers and tumors. It can either assist in tumor rejection, in which case we don't want to get rid of the eosinophils, or it can promote tumor growth in which case we do want to get rid of the eosinophils. So there's more information to be learned. At the present time, we have no information regarding the risk of tumors in people receiving these kind of medicines. Now, currently, if your asthma, even if it's severe, is very well managed on medicines that aren't causing significant side effects, then you might want to consider continuing on your current therapy. On the other hand, if your asthma is poorly controlled, this is uh, another potential option. It's not the only option, it's just another additional option. Unfortunately, it's expensive. And some people would say that it's too expensive. So the Institute for Quality and Efficiency in Healthcare says, you know, we don't really have suitable data that was presented to us by the company that suggests that there really is an added benefit of using Nucala, either directly or indirectly comparing the therapy. Now, the company says that's absolutely incorrect. Not only that, but the company says not only are we good for treating asthma with eosinophils, we're also good for treating the other kind of asthma with elevated levels of the allergy antibody, the IgE. That's not the eosinophil, but this is IgE. Well, the group that sort of gives doctors a, a good idea, unbiased idea, how good medicines are is the Cochrane Group, Cochrane Collaboration. And in 2015, they said they only had limited data av available and they really couldn't draw good conclusions. They said it was a possible improvement if you happen to have asthma with the eosinophils, but certainly if you had asthma without the eosinophils, uh, didn't think it was so good. But in 2017, they were able to reevaluate, and they said that, you know, this anti-IL-5 medicine for poorly controlled asthma seems to reduce the number of exacerbations or the flares by about 50%. But there was limited evidence for improved health-related quality of life scores, and there's limited evidence that it actually improves the lung function. 
And at least when we look at some of the questionnaires, according to Cochrane, the Cochrane group, there wasn't any significant evidence that it was really beneficial. And if we look at the Institute for Clinical, Econ Clinical and Economic Review, they said that over the course of a lifetime, that if we use this medicine, we're talking about expenses well in excess of $600,000. And the way we rate things in the United States at the present time is that we look at the quality adjusted life year. And if the quality adjusted life year is $150,000 or less, the medicine's a good deal. If it's $150,000 or more, it's not a good deal. Well, they calculated that a quality adjusted life here of Nucala would cost in excess of $380,000. Well, in excess of $150,000. Now, when I started in medicine, the number was $50,000. Well, what they did, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, is they said, hey, drug company, you ought to reduce the price by about 60 or 70, maybe even 75 percent in order for it to be of value. Well, the company said, uh, nonsense. Uh, there's no way we're going to do that, and our medicine is very good, and we don't believe your findings. Well, in November of 2017, the company submitted a supplemental biologic application, and they said they're going to have several more submissions in 2018. And they actually did two studies that showed a little bit of benefit, at least in one of the studies, for chronic obstructive lung disease, COPD, if it happened to have eosinophils, unfortunately, another study didn't show any improvement. Well, how expensive is the medicine for this tiny 100 milligram dose that you take once every four weeks? The yearly cost, cash, is about $67,000. $67,000. $67,000. The price for a tube of the stuff is almost $5,200. That's $180 a day for this medicine. The company, GlaxoSmithKline, they have revenues almost $40 billion a year, which translates to over $100 million of revenue a day and profit of $11 billion in a year since December of 2017, the price of the medicine has risen from $4,500 to almost $5,200, a 12% increase in the cost. So the current cash price is about $5,200. According to GoodRx, a fair price would be less than $3,000. So is this medicine a great advance? I'm not going to say so. I'm not really sure that it is a great advance, but certainly for a medicine that costs $180 a day, we expect a whopping success. And remember, on the studies, the patients with placebo seem to do fairly well in comparison. And interestingly, all they were doing was following medical advice. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of mechanisms that lead to asthma. And this IL-5 pathway and the treatment with Nucala, that's only involving one little tiny pathway. There are a variety of others. And that's why asthma doesn't completely go away with treatment with Nucala. Now, if you're interested in asthma and you want to learn more about some of the other drugs, you can listen to my videos on... Fisenra, or Dupixent, or Zolaire, or Brio, and there are several others. But anyway, I appreciate your watching. Thank you. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.